Our next speaker this, mor <coughs> this morning will be uh, the Dean of our Lexington, Kentucky branch school, Dr. Gary Carr. I can say good afternoon to everyone. And I'm quite sure you all should have thoroughly enjoyed the remarks that came forth from the previous vessel. And as has been said earlier, I think Dr. Harris said it when he was talking about the speakers who came forth, this relay race has really been run to perfection. And Yahweh willing, we would like to continue on that same train of thought. Now, for those who may be here new for the first time and hearing the various remarks that come forth, first of all, let me say this, that none of, none of us attain these things on our own. They're not taught out there in the university or any other kind of academically uh, trained uh, place out there in the world, but they are taught down here as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry C. Kinley, in the year 1931. Now, what Dr. Kinley claims is that the Creator called him up into heaven and showed him how the whole world was in error and what they were teaching about this man's purpose and his plan and was predicated upon the one man, Dr. Kinley, to try to reconcile the world back into our Father. And we're also here in Texas. And Texas is known as the Lone Star State. See, and down here we left want the whole uh, state of Texas to know that we are preaching about one star. See, and that's Yahshua the Messiah, see. And one of the greatest secrets ever revealed to mankind, I think Dr. Baker mentioned it last night, he said this, that there was something to a man back here with Moses. Now, one of the greatest esoteric secrets ever revealed to mankind was that the one whom the world called Jesus Christ had been here before. Now, it's obvious that the world don't know anything about it because they are all looking for his second coming. Whether they be Catholic, Presbyterian, Methodist, Seventh-day Adventist, or whatever, they are all looking for the second coming of Christ. Someone give me Matthew, the 17th chapter, and the 9th verse. Matthew 17 and 9. Uh-huh. And as they came down from the mountain. Now, this is at the transfiguration, and they're coming down from the mountain. Read. Yahshua charged them, saying, uh -huh. Tell the vision to no man. Now, he charged the disciples, saying, Tell the vision to no man. And there's a reason why he said a vision, too. But I'll get to that later. Read. Until the Son of Man uh -huh. be risen again from the dead. Now he said, tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man. Now in the 16th chapter he asked them, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? The Savior himself, he was the Son of Man. Now here he is saying, tell this vision to nobody until I be risen again from the dead. Now the word again means to repeat. And this is before his death, burial, and resurrection. So that means somewhere, someplace, he must have been here and died before. And somebody said, well, how do you know that? Get Hebrews 6, 17. Hebrews 6, 17. Uh-huh. Wherein Yahweh, uh -huh. willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise uh -huh. the immutability of his counsel, R confirmed it by an oath. Now he confirmed it by oath, read. That by two immutable things. That by two immutable things, read. In which it was impossible for Yahweh to lie. Now, he, he can't change and he can't lie. Now, if he said he's going to be risen again from the dead, then that must be true. 
Because he can't, he can't change and he can't lie, all right? Now then, he also said over there in John, the fifth chapter, that Moses wrote of him. See, now Moses is given credit for writing the first five books of the Bible, see? Now when you go back and you read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you won't find in there where Moses wrote about a man called Jesus Christ, see? Now what that means is this, either you have the wrong name, or he lied. Now, since we just got done reading that he can't lie, we're just going to take it upon ourselves to inform you that you have the wrong name. Now, first of all, as has already been said by the moderator, there are no letter J's in anybody's uh, language until the Middle Ages or around the 14, 1500. There's no J in the Hebrew, nor the Greek, nor the Latin language to this day. The man's name could not have been Jesus. See? Now, then, if his name wasn't Jesus, then what we need to find out is what was his name. Now, what we'll find out when we go back here and begin with Moses, as the first trick is already done in dealing with this vision and the tabernacle pattern, go get Exodus, the 24th chapter, and the first two verses. Exodus 24, 1 and 2. Uh-huh. And he said unto Moses, uh-huh. Come up unto Yahweh, thou and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. Now, Yahweh had this mountain roped off, and if you didn't have instructions to be on the mountain, you were supposed to be killed. Now, here he is giving Moses instructions on who he can bring up to the mountain. He said, come up unto Yahweh, thou and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of the children of Israel. See? And he said, and Moses alone and by himself should come to the top of the mountain. Is that almost right? See, now in the ninth and 10th verse, they're going to carry out the dictates of Yahweh. Go down to 9 and 10. Ninth verse. Uh-huh. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, uh-huh. and 70 of the elders of Israel. Read. And they saw the Elohim of Israel. Now in the King James Bible, it'll say they saw the God of Israel. See, then you to John 1 18, and they'll say no man has seen God at any time. That's a direct contradiction because we have a, a false name in our Bible. See, and the Bible translators, they knew that there was no easier way to deceive a man than to give him a false name. See, now then, it said, Then went up Moses and Aaron, and they happened to buy you, and said unto the elders of Israel, and they saw the Elohim of Israel. Read. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paid work of a sapphire stone. Now, whatever they saw had some feet. Read. And as it were, the body of heaven in its clearness. Whatever they saw had a body, read. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. He had feet, body, and hands. He had also said in the third chapter, he had uh, truly seen and heard, right? Now it almost sounds like we described a man. Read. Also, they saw Elohim and did eat and drink. Read on. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mouth uh-huh. and be there. Uh-huh. And I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written. Now he went up there to receive tables of stone, read. That thou mayest teach them. Uh-huh. And Moses rose up read. and his minister Joshua. Now you read on and said, and Moses rose up and his minister Joshua. Now earlier he had said, thou Aaron. Nadab and Abihu and 70 elders. Now this Joshua who rose up, he's not an elder. See? You read over there in the 33rd chapter of Exodus, but the 7th verse, that his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not all the tent. Now my question is, if he's not an elder, and he's certainly not Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, why was he on the mountain? See, because according to the dictates of Yahweh, if you were to accidentally touch that mountain, kill it. Now here this man is, he's not accidentally touching it. He's going up there with Moses. See? And the thing that we need to ask is this. If Moses had the privilege of talking to the Creator mouth to mouth and face to face, why would he even need a minister? See, there's no need to get something second-handed when you can get it from the boss himself. There must be something then to this man known as Joshua. See? Now he's first mentioned in the 17th chapter of Exodus, about the ninth verse. 
Go back and get that for me right quick, please. Exodus 17 and 9. Uh -huh. And Moses said unto Joshua, uh -huh. Choose us out men. Now this Joshua, he's going to be a warrior. Said, Choose us out men, read. And go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of Elohim in mine hand. Do you have a King James Version with the margin of translator? If you don't, in some Bibles it'll have a, a margin of translator, and for that Joshua it'll say, call Jesus. You don't have it? Well, in some Bibles, it, it will say. I have it. Okay. Exodus 17, 9. Uh-huh. Of the translator, call Jesus. Now, here your translators are. They are interchanging Jesus and Joshua. See? Now, get Hebrews 4 and 8. Hebrews 4 and 8. Uh-huh. For if Joshua, son of Nun, had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Read out the other Bible. King James Version. It should say, if Jesus had given them rest. Might be Holy Name Bible. Okay. King James Jesus Bible. Had given them rest. Now, over here in Hebrews 4 and 8, it said, if Jesus had given them rest. Is that right? Now, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, the one whom they called Jesus talking, he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, here it is over there in Hebrews, Paul, right, with some understanding, he said, If Jesus had given them rest, did he give them rest or didn't he? He said he was, but now here Paul said it looked like he didn't. But what you find out, once again, your marginal translators, they'll call that Jesus Joshua. See, because back here, they didn't have any rest. See? So then the translators, they are interchanging this Joshua and Jesus. Now remember, there's no J. Is that right? So then we know his name wasn't Joshua. All right? Now watch. Get the prophet Joel for me. Now, I want at the top of the Bible where it says what the name means. Now, as the moderator already said, and dealing with the name, now what you'll find out is that L is the abbreviated form of Elohim. See, now in the prophet Joel, Joel. Uh-huh. The book of Joel, whose name means King James, the Lord of Jehovah. Now, it, well, some Bibles will say the Lord is God. All right? Now, if the name Joel means the Lord is God, and Elohim is the abbreviated form for, or El is the abbreviated form for Elohim, and you see that we have God right up under Elohim, and now most King James Bibles will say the name means the Lord is God, then here it is, the translator is trying to tell you something, that the prefix J-O, it must have originally meant the Lord, as the world would say it, but now we know that it really means Yah. See? Now, we don't want to put a whole lot of emphasis on people's names who begin with J-O, like John, or the Jordan River, or something of that nature, but we do want to put emphasis on this one back here with Moses. See, the one that we call Joshua. Now, if you want to change that, ja go back to Exodus 24th chapter, where Moses Exodus. rock goes up. Okay. Exodus 24 and 13. Uh-huh. And Moses rose up and his minister Joshua. Uh-huh. And Moses went up into the mount of Elohim. Read. And he said unto the elders, Uh-huh. Tarry ye here for us. Now he said, Tarry ye here for us. Read. Until we come again unto you. Until we come again unto you, which means somebody else went up there with Moses. Right? Now Moses was up there for some 40 days and 40 nights. Is that right? 
Now, during which time the Creator showed him in a rerun how he created the heavens and earth and gave him 33 days on divine instructions on how to build this tabernacle pattern, which was a breakdown or an explanation of the Creator himself. Now, in Exodus 30, uh, I think it's 33 and 7. Exodus 33, 7. Uh-huh. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp or far off from the camp. 32, 15. 32, 15. And Moses turned and went down from the mount. Uh-huh. And now, what happened was this. After the 40 days had transpired, Yahweh told Moses, get thee down for the people that you brought out of Egypt. See, they hard headed and stiff neck. So Yahweh said, the people that you brought out of Egypt, they have corrupted themselves. So now here's Moses, he's turning to go down to the mountain to see what's going on, Reed. And the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. Read. The tables were written on both their sides. Uh-huh. On the one side and on the other were they written. See, they are written on both sides, Read. And the tables were the work of Elohim. Uh-huh. And the writing was the writing of Elohim graven upon the table. Uh-huh. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. Now... I thought Yahweh was the one who heard the noise. But now you're reading that Joshua heard the noise. And he told Moses that it was a noise of war. Well, if you ever read this story back here, that was not a noise of war that they were engaged in. It said that Aaron had had the people stripped in their orgy. See, that does not sound like war. See, but yet over there in Romans the 8th chapter, See, it said that a carnal mind is at enmity against Yahweh. So then what they were doing was a cause of war or no, noise of war. And that's why when Moses comes down, he has a Levitical priesthood, girt their sword, and they go through the camp and kill 3,000 people. And mind you, I said the priest did it. See? Because you know, you have a lot of preachers who preach about peace and safety. Well, back here, the priests were warriors. See, said that Le he had three, they, that Levitical priesthood girded their swords and they went to that camp and they killed 3,000 people. In addition, Moses ground that calf up, put it in their water and made the people drink it. See, now, we don't pay much significance to that. But later on when the Messiah comes in, he said, ye are of your father the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. But we still want to show you something about this man Joshua because... If we can see that the Creator had been here before he was nailed to the cross, then just by chance we might be able to see that he's been here after he was nailed to the cross. And that was the whole thing was about. Get Exodus 33 and 7 now. Exodus 33, 7. Uh-huh. And, and Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp. Now the fall. tabernacle that she's talking about is this tent it's on the back side of Mount Sinai. See, a tent and a tabernacle, they're the same thing. They are both temporary dwelling places. See, Yahweh never intended, not even in this tabernacle, to dwell permanently. See? And the tabernacle in which Joshua stayed in was on the back side of Mount Sinai in close harmony with that burning bush, and the people were over here. See? So read that again. And Moses took the tabernacle uh -huh. and pitched it without the camp, uh -huh. afar off from the camp, Read. and called it the meeting tent of the congregation. Now, this tent was called the meeting tent of the congregation, Read. And it came to pass that everyone which sought Yahweh... Now, if you out, wanted to talk to Yahweh, Read. ...went out unto the meeting tent of the congregation. You went into the meeting tent of the congregation. Which was without the camp. Which was without the camp. And it came to pass, uh -huh. when Moses went out into the meeting tent, Read. that all the people rose up and stood, every man, at now, his tent door. All the people rose up at their tent door, and they watched Moses go into the meeting tent of the congregation. Read. And it came to pass, as Moses en entered into the meeting tent, uh -huh. the cloudy pillar descended. Now I said, a cloudy pillar descended. Read. And 
stood at the door of the meeting tent. And it stood at the door of the meeting tent. And what she's talking about, that cloud descended from Mount Sinai, and then it just stood in the doorway of that, t- of that meeting tent, read. And Yahweh talked with Moses. And Yahweh talked with Moses, read. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the meeting tent door. Now all the people, they saw the cloudy, cloudy pillar stand at the tent door, read. And all the people rose up and worshipped. Uh-huh. Every man in his tent door. Read on. And Yahweh spake unto Moses face to face. Now, once again, here go Moses. He has the power to talk with the Creator face to face. See, a lot of us, we didn't believe it when Dr. Kilney said that he encountered the Creator face to face. But it's nothing new. It's, it had to have happened before. Now, here's Moses saying that he talked with the Creator face to face. Read. As a man as a man speak with his friend and he turned again into the camp but his servant Joshua Uh the son of Nun a young man Uh departed not out of the meeting tent now first of all he's a young man and second of all I never heard a read where Joshua went in (laughs) now I know she skipped some chapters so maybe if you went back for the 24th chapter and start reading, you might find where Joshua went in. You start at 33 and 7, is that right? See what 33 and 1 say. And Yahweh said unto Moses, uh-huh. Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt. Well, make a long story short, you won't read where this Joshua went into the tabernacle. See? You read where Moses went in, and where Yahweh went in. But then it said, this Joshua, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Is that right? Or not out of the meeting tent. Now, Moses didn't even know at one time who this Joshua was. See? And look, when he goes up to the mountain the third time and see the genealogies come forth out of Adam, when Moses comes back down this time, he got a veil over his face. He got some illumination or some understanding. Get for me Numbers 13 and 8, and also get for me uh, Galatians 3.19. Numbers 13 and 8. Uh-huh. Of the tribe of Ephraim. Of the tribe of Ephraim. Oshia, the son of Nun. Now, they said Oshia, the son of Nun. Now, look. Now, we had a speaker earlier na- whose name was Nun. Is that right? Dr. Jesse Nunn from North Carolina. But now here it is there, Oshia, the son of Nun. Spelled N U N. Is that right? Now we have found out through the vision that the founder had that this Oshia, the son of Nun, it really means Oshia, the son of Nun, N O N E. He didn't have any physical parents. See? He just took on a body down here in Egypt. Some 400 years after the promise was given to Abraham. And he walked around down in Egypt for some 30 years and never aged. And somebody said, well, I don't believe that. Then you don't believe the story of Adam, neither do you. Because what mother and father did Adam have? See? And all Yahweh is doing is repeating himself. See? This Joshua, he didn't, I said, didn't have any parents. I know when you read over there in Chronicles, See, it'll make you seem like that there was somebody in the Hebrew lineage named Nun. See? But no, there wasn't. And he just attached to Ephraim, who was a tribe, who was a son of Joseph. See, when you do some studying, there should not have been a tribe of Ephraim. See? Because uh, Jacob didn't have a son named Ephraim. He had a son named Joseph. They just attached this Joshua to Ephraim. Just like when the other, when the true stage would come in, they're going to attach him to a man named Joseph. See? But just like Joseph wasn't his father, he didn't have any parents. Somebody said, well, how do you know that? Well, they always tried to catch the Messiah in some kind of lie. And they asked him one time a commandment about the law, and, he, and when he got done answering them, he, he countered with this. He said, whose son is the Messiah? And they said he's going to be the son of David. He said, then if he's going to be the son of David, why was David giving glory and praise to him years ago? Now what he was trying to show him was this. 
if David wasn't going to be his father, then neither was Mary and Joe. See? And look, when we're not trying to offend anybody, because we have some, some new Catholics out there, see, because, you know, they believe wholeheartedly in the Immaculate Conception, and unless you have done some investigation, you don't know that that's not talking about the Savior. That's talking about Mary. They think there was something immaculate about Mary. No, Mary was in sin like everybody else. And look, her seed wasn't used to bring forth this son either. See? Because if it hadn't been, it would have been sinful flesh, not the likeness of. See? So I hope I don't offend nobody because we got some new Catholics. See? But I want you to know that Mary didn't have anything to do with this son being born. But now watch. Now it says the tribe of Ephraim, Oshia, the son of Nun. Go down to the 16th verse. Numbers 13 and 16. Uh-huh. These are the names of the men which Moses sent to survey out the land. Uh-huh. And Moses called Oshia. Now, and mind you, this is, this is after the third trip. And I said Moses now has some understanding. Right. Said, and Moses called Oshia, the son, the son of Nun, Yahashua. Yahashua. Now what that means is Moses called him Yahweh is salvation. See, Moses put the name on him, Yahshua. Matter of fact, that's what Moses' job was. His job was to identify the Savior back here. And it was, it was when he was back here with Moses, when he was instituting or set up a way of life for the Hebrew people, the Gentiles never were invited to the party. See? Never were. Uh, Galatians 3.19. Galatians 3.19. Uh-huh. Wherefore then serveth the law. Now, why was this law added? It was added because of transgression. Now, the law was added because of the Adamic transgression. Till the seed should come. And it was only or, uh, ordained until the seed should come. To whom the promise was made. To whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels. Now, the law from Mount Sinai, it was ordained by angels. In the hand of a mediator. In the hands of a mediator. See? Now, it was ordained by angels in the hands of a mediator. Read on. Not a, now, a mediator is not a mediator of one. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one. But Yahweh is one. But now, Yahweh is one. First Timothy 2 and 5. Now, in this law back here, it said it was added because of transgression. Now, what the law did, it made sin more sinful. See, there had always been sin in the world, but sin was not imputed or enforced, where there was no law. Now, what this law done, it made sin more sinful. See, and it was added until the seed should come. That was Yahshua the Messiah, who was going to fulfill the thing that was written back here in the law and the prophets. See, but now, 1 Timothy 2 and 5. 1 Timothy 2 and 5. Uh-huh. For one is Yahweh. Now, for one is Yahweh. And one mediator. And there's only one mediator or one goal between. And listen, only one. Now, once again, if you're in the Catholic faith, all those fathers, they're mediators. The Pope is a mediator. That's more than one. They say there's only one mediator between Yahweh and man. Who is that? That's the man. For one is Yahweh and one mediator between him and men. Uh -huh. The man, Yahshua the Messiah. Now that's the man, Yahshua the Messiah, or in the King James Bible, say that's the man, Jesus Christ. Letting you know that he had to be back here. See, when he came to the laws of the Virgin Mary, that wasn't his first time. And look, when he tabernacled here with Moses, that wasn't his first time. So you talk about you're looking for his second coming, you missed him a long time ago. See? And look, you can't go in your Bible and figure this thing out neither. That shows you that there had to be something to what the man saw. See, because that, and look, I know there are ministers out there today who teach that Christ was back there with Moses. There are ministers out there who teach that. Now, where do you think they got it from? See? See, the only way they could have gotten it is that they have heard our teaching somewhere. See, that, that's just not known to mankind. That's a secret that has been here throughout the ages. That the one whom the world called Jesus had been here before. Now look, now Moses, he dies off, is that right? 
And then, and it, this is pretty to me too, because I think Dr. Gill made mention of it, that sometimes us deans have a tendency to get big headed, to get puffed up as though we know something. See? Well, if you pay attention to this story sometime, you'll find out that these sheep that Moses had, they weren't his. See? When you read the third chapter of Exodus, that he kept the sheep of his father-in-law, Jethro. They weren't his. These sheep that we have today, they're not ours. We're just taking care of them for somebody. You see what I'm talking about? So there's no need to us getting puffed up like though we're somebody. As Gil said, we are servants. See? And look, Moses had offspring too, didn't he? But when he died, his offspring didn't take over control, did they? Huh? See, because in the third chapter of Exodus, Yahweh had already told Moses that he was going to take them to that good land, and to that land flowing with milk and honey. So when Moses dies, you'll find that he appointed Joshua to lead the children of Israel over the river Jordan. Is that right? Now, in the 10th chapter of Joshua, something phenomenal happened. Get Joshua 10, 13. Joshua 10, 13. Uh-huh. And the sun stood still. Get up a verse or two. 11th verse. Uh-huh. And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel uh -huh. and were in the going down to Beth Horon uh -huh. that Yahweh cast down great stones from heaven upon them uh -huh. unto Asaika. Read. And they died. Read. They were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Read. Then spake Joshua uh -huh. to Yahweh in the day when Yahweh delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. Read. And he said in the sight of Israel, uh -huh. Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon. Now here's a man who went out and he told the sun to stand still upon Gideon. Read. And thou moon in the valley of Angelon. And he told the moon to stand still too. See? Now, not only did he tell him to do so, but the thing that happened was this. They obeyed him. See? Now, if you don't think that's great, you go out there and try it. <laughs> See? You know, some of us stay in parts of the country that have tornadoes and so forth. Matter of fact, it wasn't too long that a tornado came through Texas, is that right? Well, if we were the one, just go out there and tell that thing, peace be still. See? But this Joshua, he told the sun and moon to stand still, and they did. See? And then, in addition to all of that, in the 24th chapter, he eliminates everybody's excuse. Joshua 24th chapter. Joshua 24 and 3. Start at 1. 1. Uh-huh. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem. Uh-huh. And called for the elders of Israel. Uh-huh. And for their heads, and for their judges, and for their officers. Read. And they presented themselves before Elohim. And Joshua... Now, Pastor, you can read, can't you? It almost sounded like she said Joshua called somebody, and, and they, they went and presented themselves before somebody else. Before Elohim. Who called them, Elohim or Joshua? Joshua. All right, go ahead, read. And Joshua said unto all the people. And then Joshua started talking. Well, you never read where they went and presented themselves before Joshua. And by the way, who wrote the book of Joshua? <laughs> who wrote the book of Joshua? <laughs> Author Joshua. Joshua wrote the book of Joshua. There's no greater authority on the matter than the man himself. And he's using himself and Elohim interchangeable. Now read on down in 24th chapter. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood. Now Joshua said, I took your father Abraham. I did it. What do you mean I did it? Don't you recall when this one walked the earth plain? They, he told the Jews that your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Said, and when he saw it, he was glad. Said, well, how do you know Abraham and you ain't even 50 years old yet? He said, before Abraham was, I am. 
Now here's Joshua saying, I took your father Abraham. From the other side of the flood. From the other side of the flood. Read. And led them throughout all the land of Canaan. And I led him throughout all the land of Canaan. And multiplied his seed. I multiplied his seed. And gave him Isaac. I gave him Isaac. And I gave unto Isaac Jacob and Esau. I gave unto Isaac Jacob and Esau. And I gave unto Esau Mount Seir. Read. To possess it. Uh huh. But Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. Read. I sent Moses also. And Look, I sent Moses. You know what Moses said? Yahweh sent me. When Moses went down to tell the children, he said, Yahweh sent me. But now here's Joshua said, I sent Moses. Read. And I plagued Egypt. I plagued Egypt. According to that which I did among them. Read. And afterward, I brought you out. And look, I brought you out. Read. And I brought your fathers out of Egypt. Uh-huh. And ye came unto the sea. Uh -huh. And the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen unto the Red Sea. Read. And when they cried unto Yahweh, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. Oh, then Yahweh put darkness between you and the Egyptians. <laughs> See, Joshua's been doing everything else, now Yahweh did it. <laughs> See, but read on. And brought the sea upon them and covered them. Read. And your eyes have seen what I have done in but, Egypt. But then look, but then your eyes have seen what I have done. See, now I told you there's no greater authority on him than the author himself. He's using himself and Yahweh interchangeable because he knew that they were one and the same. See, he knew that. And then he goes on down to the 13th verse. He left a very important message that we should always carry to heart. And I have given you a land for which ye did not labor, uh -huh. and cities which ye built not. So and I gave you a land that you didn't even labor for, in the cities that were already built. Read. And ye dwell in them. Uh -huh. Of the vineyards and olive yards which ye planted not, do ye eat. So he said, the, the land was already planted for when you got there. So you read. Now therefore, uh -huh. fear Yahweh, uh -huh. and serve him in sincerity and in truth. He said, now since Yahweh done all that, then you fear Yahweh, and serve him in sincerity and in truth. Read. And put away the idols which your father served on the other side of and the flood. And put away the idols that your father served on the other side of the flood. And in Egypt. And in Egypt. And serve ye Yahweh. And serve ye Yahweh. And if it seem evil unto you, and serve look, Yahweh. And look, you know, when I was out in Los Angeles, and this should fly over my head, Dr. Kelly used to always say, all of Israel was not of Israel. He used to always say that. And for the longest, I never understood what he was talking about. Because I thought, when you came to class, see, it was like the Holy Spirit entered into your heart and mind, so that meant you were saved. See? But come to find out, and look, people, all the analogies that we use dealing with the Catholic Church and, and what have you, they have never been our problem. Our problem have always been right among our ranks. See? Because all of Israel, when it came out of Egypt, did everybody eat sheep? And that was a Passover feast, is that right? And we're trying to pass over into eternity. So every time we come to class, we're having a Passover feast. See? And just like it was back here, not everybody's eating sheep. Somebody said, well, why do you keep saying sheep? Because when you investigate, you find that a lamb can be sheep or a goat. But we want to make sure that we eat the sheep, the lamb from the sheep, not the goat. See? Now then watch. Now this Joshua, he said, if it seems evil unto you, to serve Yahweh. To serve Yahweh. Choose you this day. They said, look, choose you this day. Don't do tomorrow. But tomorrow might be too late. Tomorrow's not promised to you. Said, choose you this day whom you will, will serve. serve. Read. Were the idols which your father served that were on the other side of the flood? Whether the idols that your father served that were on the other side of the flood? Or the idols of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell? Or the idols of the Amorites in whose land you dwell? But as for me, but as for me, and my house, and look, I'm a married man with two children. That's not my house. This is my house. My wife can't save me, I can't save her. We both got to make an account. So I help me, Father. And my children do too. See? But as for me and my house, this was Joshua's testimony. 
But as for me and my house, read. We will serve Yahweh. Now we're going to serve Yahweh. Now you're reading the book of Judges that there, there was a generation. You know, they were supposed to repeat these things that transpired in their generation years. And you'll find that there arose a generation that didn't know anything about what Yahweh had done. See? And the children corrupted themselves. And Yahweh allowed them to be taken into captivity. See? Now, man, in Habakkuk 1 and 5, somebody get that for me right quick. And also get for me Jeremiah 31, 31. Habakkuk 1 and 5, Jeremiah 31, 31. Now, in Habakkuk 1 and 5, it's been prophesied that behold ye among the nations, read. Regard and wonder marvelously. Regard and wonder marvelously. For I will work a work in your day. Now look, it has been prophesied that I'm going to work a work. Now the work that he's going to work is this. He's going to come in through the Lord of the Virgin Mary and fulfill to the jot and tittle everything that he had already instituted back in the law. Read. Which ye will not believe. And although I'm going to fulfill it, move it out the way, earth should the age of grace, you still are going to believe it. Read. Though it be told you. Though it be told to you. Now that was prophesied some 600 years before the Messiah. And here we are some 1900 years after him. And guess what? They still don't believe it. They still believe that they must do something for themselves in order to be saved. See, people, that's why we have a Savior. You weren't capable of saving yourself. He done everything for you. That's why he is your Savior. Jeremiah 31, 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. Mm -hmm. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh. Now it says, Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh. That I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now if that's who the new one's going to be made with. That's who the old one's made with. The Hebrew nation. Once again, the Gentiles weren't invited to the party. The Gentiles are included by the promise. See? To Abraham. That's how we got in, into the picture. But it wasn't by the covenant. See? Read. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. Now the new one is not going to be like the old one. Read. In the day that I took them by the hand. When I took them by the hand. To bring them out of the land of Egypt. Who done that? <laughs> Yahweh said I took them by the hand. Brought them out of Egypt. He had to be back there if he was going to take them by the hand and bring them out of Egypt. Read. Which my covenant they break. They broke it. Read. Although I was an husband unto them, saith Yahweh. No, he was a good husband. See? He provided for their every whimper, and they still weren't satisfied. See? Almost remind me of us sometimes. See, he's still El Shaddai, the almighty provider. And look, he's still taking care of the whole show. Everything is going just like Yahweh wants it to. See? But you know, sometimes we still think that we still, we in the Institute still serve a limited God. See? Although I was a good husband unto them, read. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Uh -huh. After those days, saith Yahweh, read. I will put my law in their inward part. Now I said, I'm going to put my law in their inward part. Read. And write it in their hearts. And I'm going to write it in their hearts. And will be their Elohim. I'm going to be their Elohim. And they shall be my people. And they will be my people. So then when the Savior of the world comes in, through the Lord of the Virgin Mary, and look, he had to be born of a virgin. See? Why? Because this first man, Adam, he was taken forth from virgin Mother Earth. Had no sins been committed on the earth when Adam was brought forth. The earth was in her virgin estate. In the prophecy, Isaiah 7, 14, says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. Is that right? So when the Savior comes in, he's got to be born of a virgin. Why? Because there's two witnesses to say so, the law and the prophets. And if he's not, he's not the one. See? You know, the world cries every Christmas because the hotels were filled when he was born. <laughs> right? He had to be born out there in the stable. Guess what? If he's the Savior, it had to be that way. Why? Because when Adam was created, the animals were already there. See? And then, so when the Messiah is born, God be born among the animals, 
and then place it in a manger. Why? Was Adam created one place and placed somewhere else? Well, he got to fulfill all that. See? When, the, when he's born, death decree, right? When there's a death decree down here in Egypt, that's the law. In the prophecy, Jeremiah says, Rachel crying for her children. They don't answer. So that's the law and the prophet. Those are his two witnesses. So when he comes in, he got to fulfill that. There got to be a death decree out. Kill the male babies, right? No. Pharaoh Herod said kill all the babies. Back here, it was, it was just kill male. But his was kill all the babies. The principle is a death decree, though. See? Then he's taken down to Egypt. Is that right? Why Egypt? Because Yahweh said all of Israel, all 603,550, they were his one son. Now, that's a, a miracle. How are you going to get one son out of 603,550? But when you add those numbers up, you'll find that they make up his one son. See? So then, that's the law. And the prophecy, Hosea, 11th chapter, said, When Israel was a child, I loved him and called my son, where? Out of Egypt. That's the law of the prophets, so that he had to go down to Egypt. Why? Because he got to fulfill his two witnesses talking about him. At the age of 12, he comes back and he just astounds the smart boys in the temple. Now, the reason why I say that, because you heard people say that Dr. Kinley was a sixth grade dropout. That would make him somewhere around the age of 12. See? But look, I want you to know that he has taught the PhDs and the doctors and everything else with his limited education. And the reason why I say that is because Dr. Kinley was born in 1895. You can begin to compare a sixth grade education in the early 1900s with a sixth grade education today. They, they, you can't even compare the two. But yet here this man was at the end of this age. He was the one who enlightened us about all there was to know about Yahweh's purpose and plan. And he was standing this floor and said something like this. Don't nobody know anything about the purpose and plan of Yahweh but Yahweh. And then turn right back around and expound to you uh, what the purpose and plan of Yahweh. <laughs> See? What do you think he was trying to show you? And I thought it was so pretty. When you go back and look at the creation, now Yahweh has always been in his creation. Always has. But you don't always see him. Now when he was moving upon the water in the beginning, he was planting seeds. Is that right? Now that seed, it was there the first day. It was there the second day. But you don't really see it until the third day. That's when the waters rolled back and that seed came forth, right? So then in the third day of the creation, you ought to be able to see the man. What man? Yahshua the Messiah. You ought to find him in the third day. Now what you'll find out is 1490. That's the third day. Doesn't 1490 fall in this time period? Or 2510? It don't make no difference which year you want to use it as. See, that's the third day. So according to the creation, you ought to be able to, to, to see that that seed manifests on the third day. So here's Joshua, right on time, on the third day, being manifest to the world. On the fourth day, the sun is put out there, is that right? And this sun is a reflection of the true sun, is that right? So on the fourth day, right on time, in the 4,000th year, he comes to save you. See, to fulfill all that, that, that almost right? Then the fifth day, you got the birds that fly from the fish bound, right? But then on the sixth day, there he is again, there's that man. Now, here we are today, we're down the sixth day. You ought to be able to, to spy that man out today. You ought to be able to locate him. First John 5, 19 and 20. See? I'm talking about the one to whom we had tabernacling with us known as Dr. Henry C. Kinley. I, I should always remember, when I should go to his house, he always liked children. 
a lot of children being around him. And he would ask the children, who was Dr. Kenley? And the children would always say that was Yahweh. Turn around and ask the adults who that was, and they say, oh, that's Dr. Kenley. <laughs> and he's always comment that the children have more sense than what the parents did. <laughs> See? And even at that, it still flew over our heads. We still missed it. See, you know, we didn't really begin to appreciate who that was tabernacling with us until you took off the flesh. See? No, you know, we, if I could have had the chance to walk back there with the Savior, well, a lot of us had that chance. Just didn't know it. First John 5, 19 and 20. First John 5, 19 and 20. Uh-huh. And we know that we are of Yahweh. Now look, we know. That means we don't speculate, we don't guess, theorize, or imagine. We know this. In order to know it, you had to have that self-same spirit in you that was in him. That's the only way you can know something. That's the only way. And we know that we are of Yahweh, read. And the whole world lieth in wickedness. And the whole world, bar none, lieth in wickedness, read. And we know that the Son of Yahweh has come. And we know that the Son of Yahweh is come. Right? Has come. Is come. Not has. Why not has? Because if you say it has, that gives the world an escape. See, they say, see here, he had come. No, we know the Son of Yahweh is come, and look, in the flesh. Where do you get that from? The fourth chapter. See, we know that he's come in the flesh and has given us an understanding that we may know him. That is true, right? We are in him. That is true. Even in his son, Yahshua the Messiah. Look, back here they called him Joshua. Oshia, son of Nun. They didn't always give him his true uh, credit. When the Messiah came in, you find that he charged his people, or his apostles, don't call him Joshua the Messiah. So there's no great mystery then why today we call him Dr. Henry C. Kinley. But people, there was more to it than just that. And there's nothing that's getting upset about it because that's what Yahweh chose. Yahweh chose to tabernacle in that black man. And if Yahweh didn't have any problem with it, then neither should we. And Yahweh bestowed upon him the sonship degree. And the self-same thing that he had, he gave it to us so that we too can be the son of Yahweh, Memphis in the flesh. And look, and if a son, then you are heir. Heir to the throne. And look, that's something that you ought to know. But you ain't got to boast about it, although you know it. Somebody said, what do you mean by that? Didn't Yahshua the Messiah know that he's going to get some salvation? Said, I got to go to Jerusalem, be offered up, and the third day I'm going to resurrect, right? Didn't Paul say he knew it? Say, I fought a good fight. I know I got a crown waiting for me. So here we are today with the Holy Spirit in us, then we also ought to know. But look, we ought to have some manifestations to go along with our words because, see, your, your tongue will say anything. But it has to be twofold witness, action and word. Hope you got something. Thank you. Opie. How y'all doing? That sound Texas enough? I have been thoroughly edified by this great assembly. And the gospel here has been preached in absolute unity. And I think it's important for us to be unified now at the close of this age in order to fight against the wiles of the devil. Now let's turn over there to Psalms 133. Psalms 133 and 1. Behold how good 
and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Now it's good and it's pleasant for us to dwell together in unity. And without that unity, without us being unified, we don't have a hope of going into the promised land. And the witnesses are set up back here in the law. And I just want to show you something about that if we could. Let's turn over for a minute to the 12th chapter of Revelations. Revelations 12 and 1. Now, here's what we got. Go ahead and read. And the temple of Yahweh was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his covenant. Now, wait a minute. Are you in a King James? King James Version, 12 and 1. Are, we're and in Revelation. Appeared, That's what I want. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. Now, what we've got is we've got a woman in heaven. And we are that bride of Yahshua now in this great assembly. And we have to be clothed in the sun if we expect to go on over into our inheritance. Go ahead and read. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. That's right. Read. And the moon under her feet. Now, the moon was under her feet. And the moon is representative of the flesh, or that physical, because it was a lesser light to rule the night. And that woman being clothed in Yahshua's attributes of intelligence, knowledge, wisdom, love, beauty, justice, foundation, power, and strength, would have that fleshly counterpart that we have inherited from Adam's transgression put under her feet. Go ahead and read. And the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And there was a crown of twelve stars. Read. And she, being with child... Now she was with child. Now all of us, right now, are with child. We're impregnated with the Holy Spirit, waiting to be delivered from this creation and the bondage of the flesh, so that we can go on with Yahshua into the new heaven and new earth state which has been prepared from the foundations of the world. Go ahead and read. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth. Now she was travailing in birth. She was with pain. And you women that have had a child know that childbirth is not an experience without pain. There's going to be pain involved. And if we're going to come through this thing, ladies and gentlemen, we have to be prepared to be able to endure with long-suffering the afflictions of the flesh and the world. Go ahead and read. And pain to be delivered. And we're pained to be delivered. Go ahead and read. And there appeared another wonder in now, heaven. Now there was another wonder in heaven right with that woman that was clothed with the sun and travaileth in pain. Read. And behold, a great red dragon. Now there was a great red dragon. Read. Having seven heads. Now he had seven heads. And ten horns. And he had ten horns. Read. And seven crowns upon his head. He had seven crowns upon his head. Read. And his tail drew the third part of the stars Now of he drew the third part of the stars of heaven. That is to say, a third of that heavenly host fell. Read. And did cast them to the earth. Go ahead. And the dragon stood before the woman. Now listen. Now watch this. Here's the woman waiting to be delivered, travailing in pain, already clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet. Is that what we just read? Now, here's the dragon standing where? Read. And the dragon stood before the woman. He stood before the woman. Is that right? Now, why is that significant? Look, back here in the wilderness, we have all of Israel down here in Egypt. And Yahweh is going to deliver Israel from the captivity or the bondage of Egypt. And listen, they didn't have to fight down there the first, did they? Did they have an army in Egypt? See, there was no army down there. Those people were gathered and brought out 
by the power of Yahweh, and they didn't have to fight the first. And as they came to the Red Sea, where was Pharaoh and his chariots? He was behind them. Is that right? Satan was right behind them, trying to pull them back into captivity. Isn't that right? Now, when you came down here for your first time, you were being delivered out of the world. And weren't those things there trying to pull you back out of this gospel? See? Now, here's what's happened. Israel has gone into the wilderness. She has then been organized into an army of uh, each tribe having men that were counted for the army. Is that right? Now, here she has fought battles in the wilderness. Joshua, see, held up Moses' arm. But Joshua fought the battles as Moses' arm was held up, and they prevailed. Now, here's what's happening now. We've got the spies coming back down in from Canaan's land. Go over there real quick to Numbers, the 13th chapter. Let me show you something about that. Keep your point in Revelations, the 12th chapter. Numbers 13 and 1. All right. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, All right, read. Send thou men, that they may survey the land of Canaan. Now, there were spies sent to survey the promised land. Is that right? Now, we've had people right in this gospel that have been telling you right along that Canaan's land, we can have it. We can be a partaker of that divine nature. We don't have to be caught up in the flesh. We don't have to be in bondage of that Adamic man that we've all inherited. Joshua has given us liberty by his spirit. Now watch. Go ahead and read. Send thou men that they may survey the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. All right. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man. All right. Every one a ruler among them. Mm -hmm. And Moses, by the commandment of Yahweh, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. That's all, right. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. Go ahead. And these were their names. Of the tribe of Reuben, Shammah, the mm -hmm. son of Zachor. All right. Of the tribe of Simeon, Saphat, the son of Hor. All right. Now, of the tribe of... All right. Cut down to where they came back with the report. I'm not sure what verse that's at, where the spies had come back I don't know if it's down there around thir uh, 20, 26. 26. All right, that's it. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron all right. and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh. Go ahead. And brought back word unto them and all unto right. all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Now there's what the, here's what they did. They went up there into Canaan's land, spied it out, and brought back fruit to show them the witness that they could take that promised land. Is that right? Go ahead and read. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us. That's right, read. And surely it flowed with milk and honey. Now it's Joshua and Caleb that are bringing back that fruit. Go ahead and read. And surely it flowed with milk and honey. And the and this previous the speaker has already showed you who Joshua was. Is that right? See, we know who was in that. That was Yahweh Elohim that had brought back the fruit from Canaan's land. See? Go ahead and read. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. Mm -hmm. now, the now watch. He said the people be strong that dwell in the land. And the city, they weren't weaklings. They weren't, quote, wimps. You follow? You didn't have to fight down there in Egypt. There was going to be a fight now to take Canaan's land or the promised land. It's not going to be something that you are just going to walk into, so to speak. See? But Yahweh is with you. Go ahead and read. The cities are walled. And the cities are walled. And very great. And they're great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. That's right. Read. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. Go ahead. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. Go ahead and read. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. That's right. Go and ahead. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it. Now let us go up at once and... Now listen. Joshua and Caleb had no fear, did they? They said, let's just go up there and take it now. Why? Why didn't they have fear? Because they trusted in Yahweh all the way through that trek. Look, they knew Yahweh was their Savior when he opened up that Red Sea down there and brought them through out of the land of Egypt. 
He knew that Yahweh Elohim was providing them uh, every, all of their needs here in the wilderness, that he did not bring them out there to die. And now he trusts that Yahweh will take them into that land and overcome those mighty giants that were up there. Go ahead and read. For we are well able to overcome it. We are well able to overcome it. Read. But the men that went up with him said, Mm -hmm. We be not able to go up against the people. Now listen, here comes ten other spies, is that right? See, they're the majority, so to speak. And they say, look, we can't go up against those giants. For they are stronger than we. They're stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had surveyed unto the children. They brought up an evil report. Listen, they discouraged the people from going in and taking that inheritance. And the people did not believe the true report, did they? Look, Satan down here in Egypt was at their heels, right or wrong. But these Canaanite tribes up here, ladies and gentlemen, which are also figurative of those satanic spirits, they were where? Before their face. Or that is to say, right up in their face with, as they were about to take that land. Is that right? See? Hold your point. Go back over to Revelations 12 where we left off. Revelations 12 and 4. And it's tells drew the third part of the stars of heaven. All right. And did cast them to the earth. Read. And the dragon stood before the woman. Now the dragon stood before the woman. Right before her. Is that right? See? Now listen. When, when the, uh, the, those satanic spirits were up here in Canaan's land, standing before Israel, trying to resist them from taking their inheritance, You've got something that had to occur, and that is that they had to be organized and unified as an army, right or wrong. Down there in Egypt, they didn't need to be organized, but now they have to be unified. And Yahweh Elohim is the one that unified them. And therefore, when that second generation, which was Israel, or that one son, born again, was organized and crossed over Canaan's land, we're talking after the 40-year tenure, we've got something that is going to happen as a result of that unity. Go on over there to Joshua, the fifth chapter. Everybody following this, or is this too difficult? I'm trying to make it simple. Joshua 5. Because I see this great congregation. It's Joshua unifying us together now at the close of this age so that we can fight against the wiles of the devil, so that we can uh, provoke each other onto good works, see, that we might be edified in the bond of peace. Look, go ahead and read. Joshua 5, 1. And it came to pass, when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, Now watch, you got those kings. Those are the giants, the kings of those giants. Is that right? Here they are, see, they're westward, east, they're all around, so to speak. Go ahead and read. When all the kings heard that Yahweh had dried up the waters of Jordan from mm -hmm. before the children of Israel. He had dried it up. In other words, he had parted that veil and allowed them to penetrate on in, into the promised land. He had allowed them to go into the most holy place or to receive their inheritance. Go ahead and read. Until we were passed over. Go and ahead. their heart melted. Now listen, here's what happened to them. Their hearts melted when they found out that Israel was no longer in a state of fear and disunity their heart melted and what happened read neither was their spirit in them anymore. now there was no spirit in them either see the devil is really a coward and over there in James James writes listen resist the devil and he shall flee from thee see now, we can't be afraid to do that which Joshua would have us to do because the fact of the matter is the devil, as it was spoken by a speaker last night, is no match for him. But we must realize that we are saved by grace. And it's not our power, as the speakers have been saying up here, it doesn't make any difference if you're a dean, a student, None of us have any power to do anything but what Yahshua puts within us. And we haven't got any, any sufficiency of ourselves. None of us are anything in here. We're not such a big deal. See? We have to recognize that he's our Savior. And, you know, that brings me to a remembrance, a memory, 
of Dr. Kinley at one conversation that I had with him years ago told me that when he was sent out of that holiness church, the, the, the church of God, he said he was kicked out of there because he couldn't see through grace. And he said that after he had the vision, he said, I couldn't see through it then and I can't see through it now either. Our salvation, ladies and gentlemen, is by grace. It's not by us doing anything to get it. The fact is that grace means unmerited reward. You don't earn it. You don't do anything for it. And the children of Israel back here, look, Yahweh had set the type up that he was saving them by grace all the way down through. Listen, when they were here in the wilderness, Yahweh spoke in that law from Mount Sinai. Now he gave, he gave Adam one commandment, Adam and Eve. She couldn't keep it. Here he gives the children of Israel these ten commandments. The first thing that he spoke was, I don't want no false images. No idols. Could she keep it? No, she could not. But now watch. While Israel was taking that which Yahweh had provided for them down in Egypt, I'm talking about the gold and all of that other stuff. See, while they were in the wilderness here, Moses was up in the mountain seeing the vision. They were down here constructing a calf, a golden image, being disobedient. But now watch the wisdom of Yahweh. Look, this is grace, ladies and gentlemen. He is revealing to Moses in this vision a pattern. And I remember that it's been stated many, many times by the founder that this tabernacle is a pattern and plan of salvation. Is that right or am I wrong about that? Now watch. If that's a pattern of salvation, then what Yahweh did is he provided this structure which would be an atonement for their sin before before the people even sinned. He provided a plan of salvation before they had worshiped or built that calf to show you that by his mercy and by grace they would be saved, not by their own works. Now, let me show you something else about this. I want to show you something about these covenants back here. Now the world is out here trying to establish their own righteousness. And what they have said, now what you got basically in Christianity, you got the Catholic Church that started the whole lie. And Billy Carroll explained something to you about that last night. They said that there are seven sacraments instituted by Christ. And a sacrament is something that has been instituted, it's an outward sign to give grace, that we can obtain grace by. Is that somewhere near right? Now, what we had happen was another man named Martin Luther, who was a Catholic priest that decided to break away from the Catholic Church. He said no, he had a better idea about it. He's kind of like Ford. And his attitude was, we don't need seven sacraments, there's only two. And his two sacraments were baptism and Lord's suppers. And he said that by performing these rites, we can obtain grace. Now, grace, as I already explained to you, means unmerited reward. You don't do anything to get it. Yet they're giving you something that you can obtain grace by. And the real lie of the matter is that they're claiming that Yahshua the Messiah instituted these things while he was walking over the Palestinian hills. Now, I want to show you something about that because, quite frankly, that's not what my Bible says. Go on over to John for a minute, the fifth chapter, and let's find out if he instituted anything. John 5 and 1. Salvation, ladies and gentlemen, has always, always been by grace. And there's no other way that we are going to obtain our inheritance other than the grace of Yahshua. And I want to show you today that Yahweh had given them an opportunity back there under the law to try to establish their own righteousness. And we'll see what happened as a result of that. Go ahead and read. John, John 5, I want 530, I think I called for. Go ahead. John 5 and 30. All right. I can of mine own self do nothing. Now, here Yahshua says, he of his own self can do nothing. Is that right? Now, here's the Messiah saying that. What makes us think that we can do anything? We sit here and think sometimes, well, I'm going to do this for the gospel, I'm going to do this for class, and I'm going to get on the floor and say this. You can't do a thing for this teaching. See? Go ahead and read. 
I can of mine own self do nothing. All right. As I am taught of my father. Now it's I Yahweh know. that taught him. Are you reading from the King James, by the way? Would you do me a favor and read everything out of the King James unless I specify otherwise? Go ahead. John 5 and 30, King James Version. All right. I can of my own self do nothing. Mm -hmm. As I hear, I judge. All right, go ahead. And my judgment is just. Now he said that his judgment is just. Read. Because I seek not mine own now will. Now he's not after his own will, is he? Read. But the will of the Father who hath sent me. I'm after the will. Now what I seek to do is do the will of the Father, not my own will. That's why my judgment is just. Read. If I bear witness of myself. Now listen. If I bear witness of myself. Read. My witness is not true. My witness is not true. Now what they're doing out here in the world is telling you. They're going around ringing doorbells. They're stopping you in airports. And they call it witnessing to Christ. Is that right? And they ask you a simple question, have you accepted Jesus into your heart as your personal Savior? And if you say, well, yeah, or no, or whatever, in their mind they walk away satisfied because they just witnessed. Now here the Messiah says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Read. There is another that beareth witness of there me. There is another that beareth witness of me. Read. And I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Go ahead. Ye sent unto John, and he bore witness unto the Now truth. you went over there to John the Baptist. John the Baptist was back here baptizing unto repentance. Is that right? These people recognized that they were with sin, and John was preparing them for the Messiah. John was born full of the Holy Spirit. And John pointed out Yahshua and said, Behold the Lamb of Yahweh that cometh to take away the sins of the world. John bore witness unto the truth. Read. But I receive not testimony from man. Now I don't receive testimony from man. Read. But these things I say that ye might be saved. Go ahead. He was a burning and a shining light. Now John was a burning and a shining light for a season. Read. And ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. That's right. But Go I ahead. have greater witness than that of John. He said, I got greater witness than that of John. Look, he said he had greater witness than somebody that had the Holy Spirit. Did John have the Holy Spirit when he bore witness of him? He said he's got a greater witness than that. Now the world says the Messiah came to institute. That means to start, to establish, to begin, to set up. Is that right? Now watch what he says his witness is. Go ahead. But I have greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father the has works, given me... The works which the Father has given me... To finish... To finish... The same works that I do... Bear witness of he me. said that the works that the Father gave him to finish, they bear witness of him. He didn't come to start anything, ladies and gentlemen. He came to finish something, and that would bear witness of him. And I, I challenge anybody to go show me in your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where the Messiah said he came to start anything. You can't even find the word institute in there. Yet they claim that the Messiah instituted sacraments which were an outward sign to give us an opportunity to obtain grace. He said he came to finish some works. Go on over there to Matthew 5, 17. And I want Luke 24, 44, please. Matthew 5, 17. Go ahead. Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. Now don't you think that I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. Why, why didn't he come to destroy them? Look, in John 5, 39, he told them to search the scriptures. Is that right? Now the scriptures are those writings from uh, Moses, the Genesis down through Malachi. Not the New Testament. When he told them to search the scriptures, the New Testament hadn't been written yet. And he said, they testify of me. Look, the works that he came to finish are all set up back in the Law and the Prophets. Therefore, when he comes in, he is going to fulfill something that has already been instituted. Go ahead and read. Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. Mm -hmm. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. I didn't come to destroy, I came to fulfill. What does the word fulfill mean? It means to bring to an end, to finish. Now here, he's on the Sermon on the Mount with 5,000 people lying through his teeth, saying that he came to finish because they said he came to start. Now watch this. He's going to go to the grave with that lie. Luke 24, 44. Luke 24, 44. And he said unto them, 
These are the words which I spoke Now these are the you. words that I spake with you, Reed. While I was yet with While you. While I was yet with you. In other words, he had already gone through the death, burial, and resurrection. Is that right? Now here he's saying he's going to stick to that same lie. See, they're calling him a liar out there. They're saying he came to start something. He said he came to finish. Now you can put your bet on whoever you want of who's telling the lie. I would say that if you were a wise betting man, you'll put your money on Yahshua and forget what they're telling you out there in the world. Down here, we're not trying to tell you our doctrine, our theories, our opinions. We're trying to tell you what doth saith your creator, that you can have an understanding of him by his own words, not by a man's interpretation. And this gospel is the product of a divine vision and revelation. And our founder couldn't see through grace before the vision, and he can't see through it now either. We're not going to be saved by works. He said he's come. Go ahead and finish that out. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you. While I was yet with you. Read. That all things must be fulfilled. Everything has got to be fulfilled. Read. Which were written in the law of Moses. Which was written in the law of Moses. Read. And in the prophets. And in the Psalms. And in the Psalms. Concerning me. It's all got to be fulfilled. It's got to be completed. It doesn't. Now watch. Here's what you got. Back here under the law. Yahweh had set up a covenant with his people. This covenant was set up when Moses took the people out of the land of Egypt down here, brought them to the mountain, and Yahweh said he would speak to them from Mount Sinai. The truth of the matter is, it was a marriage ceremony. It was a wedding that was going on, and they were exchanging vows. They said to Moses, hey, when he spoke, the ground shook, the mountain shook. They said, look, Moses, tell him, whatever he says, we'll do it. No problem, just don't have him speak to us like that anymore. Look, they said, I do. Whatever he says, I'll do it. Now, they made an agreement to be obedient to whatever he gave them. Now, he spoke in from Mount Sinai a law, the Ten Commandment law, which were written in tables of stone in the shape of a heart, not tombstones that you see over there in the Ten Commandments by Cecil B. DeMille, but it was in the shape of a heart. And listen, they gathered around the mountain, agreed to keep this law. Now, here's what Yahweh did. He gave them an opportunity to establish righteousness. Now, watch. I want to pick up a point first. Go to uh, 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 Romans 5.14, please. Stay with me. I'm going to try to see if we can get some, some of these things out. I've got a lot on my mind. I don't know if I'll be able to get it all out. Romans 5.14. Go ahead. Nevertheless, Death reigned from Adam to Moses. Now watch. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. Here's what you had happen here. Back here in the garden, Yahweh told Adam, of every tree you may free, freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge, of good and evil, in the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. He didn't say, if you eat of it, you will surely die. He said, in the day you do eat, you will surely die. It was a foregone conclusion that Adam was going to die. And if you watch the film, the founder explained it to us. He set it up three days before Adam was even created. Look, in the Genesis on the third day, you have the seed of vegetation come forth. Is that right? Now, he said trees should yield seed after its own kind. How does a tree, see, regenerate or propagate itself? It has to have something, fruit or seed, fall from the tree. That fruit, when it falls away from that tree, is as it were a death. Therefore, that fruit has got to fall away first, and then it is buried. Then it will resurrect a new tree. So therefore, there has to be a death that is set up here with these trees three days before Adam. Now, when Yahshua healed the blind man, he said to him, what do you see? And he said, I see men walking as trees. Now, did Yahweh tell Adam to be fruitful and multiply? Why would you tell a man to be fruitful? Now, did Adam have kids over there in the Garden of Eden? When did he have the kids? After the transgression, when he came forth, right? Why? Because we can't have no fruition or offspring till there's a falling away first from that tree. That's why it was set up three days before, Mo before Adam was even put on the scene. It was a foregone conclusion that Adam was going to have to die at that tree. And listen, when he ate of that fruit, he lived for 930 years. Doesn't seem like a day to me. But if you understand the purpose of Yahweh, the death did not take place with his physical body the moment he ate the fruit of that tree. The death 
was within Adam's heart and his mind. He was dead in his conscience. As a result of disobedience, he was alienated from Yahweh. And look at the wisdom. Yahweh did not allow him to have offspring up here in this garden. It wasn't until they came forth. Why? Because Yahweh is setting it up that all of mankind is going to be, therefore, an inherent of Adam's nature. Therefore, they all are going to be born with a mind that is subject unto condemnation. Look, read it in, in 5.14 there, please. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Now, death reigned. What do you mean it reigned? They are all dead. Is that right? None of them had eternal life. They all died, see? And it reigned from where to death? Or, or from uh, Adam down to who? Moses. Moses. Why to Moses? Why not down to Yahshua? Why to Moses? Because when the law was given, this law, Yahweh gave them an opportunity to establish their righteousness. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me. Yahweh knew that they weren't going to be able to do it. But he said, here, take a shot at it. I'll give you something that you can establish your own righteousness. We'll see if it works. And this law was contrary to their nature. They could not keep it. See? Look, go over there to Deuteronomy 5, uh, uh, 6, 35, please. Deuteronomy 6, 35. Go ahead. I think I call it right. It's 6, 25? Okay. Let's try 25. 6, 25. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do now all watch. these commandments. Now watch. Watch this. He said it shall be our righteousness. Is that right? That they could have their own righteousness if they did what? If they observed to do all that he had commanded them. It would be their own righteousness. Now that's key because this covenant that was set up up here had an objective. The objective that was set up is if you can do it, it'll be your righteousness. Now here's what happened. The children of Israel, after they got the law, Adam couldn't keep one. They can't keep 10 or 100 or 200 of them. The first one that he gave them, they broke. The first one that was given to Adam, he broke. See, or Eve was in the transgression. The point of the matter is, is that these people could not keep this covenant. They were sinning constantly, and Yahweh had already provided the atonement for their sin before they even committed the sin because he knew that they couldn't keep it. If they could have kept it, there would have been no need for the tabernacle. And your creator knew they couldn't keep that law. He knew their nature was contrary to it. Why then did he give them something they couldn't keep? Because he was setting them up, ladies and gentlemen, for something very important. Look, go over there to the third chapter of Genesis. I want to show you some. Get down there, now lest the man put forth his hand. This is after he's eaten the fruit, and he's going to be sent forth from the garden. Okay, this is Genesis 3.22. All right. And Yahweh Elohim said, Behold, the man has become as one now of us. Now watch. Here he's saying the man has become as one of us. Read. To know good and to evil. To know good and evil. Read. And now. Now listen. He didn't send him out of the garden because he ate the fruit. That's not why Yahweh sent Adam out of the garden, because he touched the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This is why he sent him out. Read. And now, lest, and now, he, put lest he put his forth his hand and take also, of the, and take of, also of the tree and of eat, life and eat and live, forever. and live forever. We can't have him eating of that tree and living forever at this point. And we can't allow it to happen. Now, was there a commandment given to Adam not to eat of the tree of life? You don't read that in the second chapter of Genesis, do you? He was only told not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, why would he be wanted to eat of the tree of life? He already had life before the transgression. He was in a state of paradise. He was in a state of fruition up here. Everything was provided. He didn't have to want for anything. And I might say that Adam and Eve, since they had no way to have any contrast prior to the transgression, did not appreciate what they had been given at that point. Therefore, the devil was easily able to tempt Eve and tell her there's something better than what you got already. Just eat this fruit and you'll know about it. Now, if she had really understood the gift of Yahweh in that they had life up here, they were in a state of fruition, look, if she could have appreciated it, she probably would have eaten that fruit. But that was not according to the purpose. The purpose was, you're going to eat it. 
you're going to die, and we're going to send you out of the garden so you don't eat of the tree of life. Why? Because we're going to set up 4,000 years of history and bring you back into the garden at the prescribed time. And under this trip, now, you will appreciate every piece of fruit that I give you. Now watch. Read the next verse, please. 23. Therefore, Yahweh Elohim sent him forth from the Garden of Eden. Now, he sent him forth from the Garden of Eden. Read. To till the ground from now which listen. he was taken. Now listen. He brought him forth to till the ground from which he was taken. Now, the ground and the flesh are synonymous, right or wrong. Now, what, what are you talking about? Sent him out there to till the ground. Listen. Till. Till means to cultivate. What is a cultivation? According to my dictionary, it reads the preparation of the ground to raise crops. Look, what we're going to do is we're going to prepare the flesh for a resurrection. And therefore, you're going to have to go out of this garden here and we're going to have to bring man down through 4,000 years of death so that when the resurrection is made manifest, you'll be prepared to receive the new covenant. You understand that? We have to prepare these, the world for the Messiah. That's why they were not allowed to eat the tree of life. That's why he gave them a shot here at their own righteousness, and they couldn't keep it. They didn't have any righteousness. Go to Isaiah 64.4. Now, I hope this isn't too difficult to understand. See? Isaiah. I'm, I'm trying to cut it up because we've we got a limited amount of time. It's always the case. These things can go on and on and on, and the gospel has been preached to the point now where when you walk out of here, you will be full. Your, your bucket should be full of fruit. I know I'm sitting back there stuffed thinking I can't take another bite. Walk out of here, my head's going, thinking about all the things that have been revealed already. And it's so wonderful to have Yahshua lift us above the flesh and allow us to be a partaker of that spirit in unity. Watch. Go ahead and read, please. Isaiah 64, 4. For since the beginning of the world, mm -hmm. men have not heard nor perceived by the ear. Now, we in Isaiah 64, 6, I think, is what I'm after. 64, you six. have to excuse me. I don't have as many brain cells I had when I first came into the school. <laughs> I've grown a few years, and they've deteriorated with time. Go ahead and read. 64, 6. I used to remember scriptures left and right, and I find now that I'm close. Go ahead. But we are all as an unclean thing. Now, watch. Here's Isaiah. The people have come down now since this law was given, breaking it left and right. They can't keep it. They're sinning constantly. Yahweh sent in the prophets to warn them. And what are they doing? Beaming the prophets on the head with a rock. Killing them because they don't want to preach smooth things unto me. Don't tell me what I don't want to hear. Tell me how wonderful I am. Well, that's not Yahweh's purpose to tell us how wonderful we are because if we tell you how wonderful you are, we have not killed the soil. Why? When you till the soil, you are breaking up that hard earth. The earth is packed, and you have to break it up. And when you come in here, you have a hard heart, and we've got to break that heart down and prepare it for righteousness. And the only way it's going to happen, look, you can't, work, you can't work out there in the garden without getting dirty. Can you? So when we're working in the garden of Yahweh, we have to deal with all of the problems of the flesh. And not be afraid to get our hands dirty. And listen, when that man is working out there in the garden, does he work standing up trying to plant stuff? Or does he have to humble himself and bend over and get right down there with the dirt? And that's Yahshua, who is the husbandman, coming down unto us, working with us who are all as an unclean thing, so that he might raise us in power. The point is that we have to recognize that his mercy and his grace is that he has made himself likened unto sinful flesh. He's gotten down into the dirt with us, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not saying that he was with Spot. He is aware of our afflictions and our infirmities. We are not uh, subject to a high priest who is unaware of our afflictions and infirmities, as Paul discusses there in Hebrew. Go ahead and continue reading, because I'm running out of time. But we are all as an unclean thing. We're all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousness are as filthy Look, rags. Look, all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. There ain't none of us that are righteous. It ain't our righteousness that we're, is going to save us now that we've come into the school either. We're still saved by grace. And many things have been spoken to you since you've come into the school and you have not been able to keep it all. You have not been able to stop your kids or whatever these problems are we're dealing with out here. And some of us just don't even care, really. It's high time for us to recognize that 
See, we cannot establish our own righteousness. Salvation is through that spirit of Yahshua the Messiah, and without that spirit in us, we don't have a hope of glory. And we have to trust in Yahshua to deliver us from the bondage of the flesh. We're too weak. See, go on over there to uh, uh, Jeremiah for a minute, 31, 31. Then go over there to uh, Ezekiel, 36, 24. Jeremiah 31, 31. Go ahead. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. He said, I'm going to make a new covenant. Listen, he's going to make a new one. Now watch. Go ahead. That I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Go ahead. And with the house of Judah. Go ahead. Not according to the covenant now, that I made. Now it won't be according to the covenant that I made with them back there. What do you mean, not according to it? Well, according to this covenant, if you could keep it, it'd be your righteousness. Under the new covenant, it won't be according to that. Because when I put my spirit in you, I will cause you to walk in my statutes. And you won't be doing a thing. See? You're not the one that's going to save yourself under this covenant. It's not going to be according to this one. I'll put my spirit in you. I'll clean you from all your filthiness. We better get it straight and recognize who's doing the saving around here, not us. See? Go on over there to Ezekiel 36, 24. For I will take you from among the heathen. And we've been taken from among the Look at this great assembly, which is nothing compared to the world. We see 4,000 in here. There are churches that have more than 4,000 members in one location. We think we are some... We haven't been chosen because we're such a mighty people, but because we're the fewest of all people. See? Go on over there for a minute to the seventh chapter of Numbers. Real quick, because I'm running out of time. 7-7. Seven, seven. Hold your point in Ezekiel, because I'm not done there either. Numbers 7 and 7. Read. Two, two wagons and four oxen he gave unto the sons of Gershon. Are we in Numbers 7-7? Seven, seven? Then I'm wrong. I want to Deuteronomy 7-7. Seven, seven. And that goes to show you another one of those cells that have been missing. Deuteronomy 7-7. Seven, seven. Go ahead. Yahweh did not set his love upon you. Now watch. Yahweh did not set his love upon you. Read. Nor choose you. And he didn't choose you. Because she were more in number than Because you were people. more in number than any of the other people. We, he said, I like a big congregation. Let's put 4,000 people in a ballroom in Texas. The Crystal Cathedral holds more than this out there in California, right? See? He didn't choose us or set his love upon us because we were so many Read. For ye were the fewest of all people. We're the fewest. And the low downest, too. You follow? Some of the ugliest, meanest people in the world. <laughs> but you're not so hard that you can't be softened up by the preaching of this gospel. Go ahead and read. But because Yahweh loved you. It's because he loved us, ladies and gentlemen. Read. And because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your father. And he's going to keep the oath which he has sworn unto us all along. Read. Has Yahweh brought you out with a mighty hand? He has brought us out with a mighty hand. The things that have been preached right in this convention show that we did not come in here empty-handed. We are being brought out with a mighty hand. Read. And redeemed you out of the house of bondage. And he has redeemed us from the house of bondage. Read. From the hand of Pharaoh. From the hand of Pharaoh. King of Egypt. King of Egypt. Now, Read. therefore. Read. That Yahweh thy Elohim, he is Elohim. All right, that's faithful. enough out of that. I want to show you something else here because I'm down to the wire here. Look. The Messiah comes in to fulfill this law, ladies and gentlemen, and move it out of the way to usher in a new covenant. That new covenant is his spirit being put within us. That's over there in Ezekiel 36. I don't have time to have you read it. But he said, I'll put my, he said, I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit will I put with you. Why a new heart? Look, this heart that Moses brought down from on top of the mountain, Yahweh sent his heart down to those people. And that heart was broken because the people could not receive that love of Yahweh. Listen, he had loved them when he brought them up out of Egypt. He loved them all the way through and they still were disobedient. They broke his heart. Now we have to prepare a new heart. And that new heart Moses has to take from down below. Bring it up unto Yahweh and he'll write that new covenant in that heart. And then put his spirit in. He said, I'll give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit in you. Is that right? We have to have a new heart. And in Deuteronomy 5.29 he says, Oh, that the people had such a heart that they would obey me and keep my commandments. 
Look, Joshua comes in, he had that heart. That's why he was the one that was able to fulfill the law and the prophets, because he had a heart that was not like the people. Look, go on over there to Matthew 5, 34. Then I want Romans 8, 13. Quick, and I want to finish this out here. We got a heart, Yahshua, a heart of gold, ladies and gentlemen. Matthew and this 5, is what has allowed him to fulfill the law. Read. Matthew 5, 34. Read. But I say unto you. And I say unto you. Swear not at all. Are we, we're in Matthew 5, 34? Oh, boy, I called it wrong again. <laughs> Look. What is it? John 5, 30, that's not what I'm after either. It's in Matthew. 23, 34, 22, 34, that's it. Matthew 22, 34. Matthew 22, 34. Now watch, please. Go ahead. But when the Pharisees... Now here comes the Pharisees, read. ...had heard... Read. ...he had put the Sadducees to silence... Read. ...they were gathered together. Now they decide to get up against him, see, because he put the Sadducees quiet. Now they figure they'll take their shot. We're smarter than the Sadducees. We're learned in the law. Read. Then one of them... Go ahead. The lawyer asked him a question. They asked him a question. Testing him. Tempting and him. Saying, and saying, Master, Master, which is the great commandment What is the, the great law? commandment in the law? Read. Yahshua said unto him, Read. Thou shalt love Yahweh thy Thou shalt thy love Elohim Yahweh thy Elohim with, with all of thy heart. And with all thy soul. With all thy soul. And with all thy mind. Listen, if the people had loved Yahweh with all their heart, would Yahweh have had to give them a law saying, don't worship any false idols? If they loved him, there would have been no need for the law. And listen, he said, the second is like it unto this, that you love your neighbor as yourself. If they loved their neighbor, would have he had to say, don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Love is the fulfilling of the law, ladies and gentlemen. And without it, you don't have that new heart. Go over there to Romans, the 8th chapter, quick. 14. 13 first. 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? Where in Romans? 13.8. You have to excuse me. Romans 13 and 8. Read. Oh, no man anything. Now listen, he said, oh, no man anything. But to love but one to another. But to love one another. Listen, Dr. Kinley said to us this before he took the flesh off. He said, you're not far behind. Get your house in order and you ought to love one another. See? And listen, we owe it to each other. See? And if we don't have that divine love within us, we will not be in the righteousness of that new covenant which allowed Yahshua to fulfill the law. Read it. For he that loveth another for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the hath law. fulfilled the law. Read. For this thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Read. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Read. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not Read. covet. Read. And if there be any other commandment, Read. it is briefly comprehended in this saying. It thing. is comprehended in this saying. Namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor thou as Thou shalt love thyself. thy neighbor as thyself. Now I'll say this in closing. Joshua in the 13th chapter of John said this, I give you a new commandment, that you ought to love one another even as I loved you. Listen, he didn't say love yourself, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. That was an old commandment that was back there in the law. He said, you ought to love one another as I have loved you. That's a new commandment. And he said, by this will the world know that ye are my disciples. Now, if we want to be the disciples of Henry Clifford Kinley and of Yahshua the Messiah, let us learn to love one another and be tenderhearted, forgiving one another, and be unified in this great gospel because that is a witness to the world that this is a reality within us. Let's manifest it. Let's make it real, unfeigned love, not just words, but let's really be considerate towards one another. And I thank you for the time to address you.